Good morning. We do have, um, we're trying to get a few logistical pieces in place here, so we're just running a little bit behind. It's always awesome when people are uh, speaking in uh, in the back and they're having such a good time they lose track of time. So they're just pulling some pieces together for this morning's communion. So thank you for being patient. <laughs> we should have the background music for you. <laughs> la 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 la. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So happy Easter. He is risen. <laughs> yeah. So we have lots to celebrate in a sunny sky out there today. I just um, so much to be thankful for. And um, yeah, I'm kind of overwhelmed. There's so much to be thankful for these days. I just really want to pray and lift up God and the power of his resurrection and that gives us life I just think that's just amazing so father we just we love you we thank you for the way you move we don't even understand the workings and the mystery but you're such a good father we just lift you up today we worship you you deserve all the honor and the glory and the praise and Help us to wrap our heads around the sacrifice and the life you've given us. We just give our service to you. We bless our community and we bless um, this service this morning. And we just want to lift it up to you. Thank you that you've brought John and Jan here this weekend and for the rest of the week to do interviews and to get a little snapshot of our church and just... We just ask, Holy Spirit, that you come and presence yourself with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have the worship team come up. Doing something a little more unusual today as well, because we don't have a lot of instruments this morning, so we're going to do a little bit of combined real singing with some um, panned background music. Jan and myself back into your family here at Terrace Alliance. For a number of you... The person standing here or the person sitting beside me over in the hot pink, uh, the face and person that you see um, may be familiar to some and maybe not so much for others. I was your pastor back between 2007 and 2012, and then God led us on a journey elsewhere for these past 10 years. But you know what? what's amazing is that both Jan and I knew then in 2007, when we first came, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that God had placed us here in this place and embedded us into the fabric of this church and of this community. And we are as sure now, in April of 2022, 15 years after we first arrived, that beyond a shadow of a doubt, we know that God has called us back to join you again as he resets Terrace Alliance Church, to be a beacon of light, to be a city on a hill, to be an encampment of God, to bring his light and his love and his glory to the Northwest. And we're as confident now as we were then that God strategically placed Jan and myself here to walk with you, to support you, to encourage you, to raise up the foundations of this ministry so that together as the body of Christ, we may continue what God started here 71 years ago when Terrace Alliance Church was born in the very DNA and fabric of the Christian and Missionary Alliance in Canada. 71 years, friends. Why are we here? We are here to be a movement of God's spirit for the greater good among the first inhabitants of these lands, along with those of us here who now as guests on these lands, live to love and to serve one another and to allow the reign of God 
to fall afresh on this place for his infinite glory. Friends, God is here. He's always been here. He hasn't left you. He hasn't abandoned you in any way. He's well aware of some of the hurt and the pain or the frustration or the confusion that some have borne through the experiences of the last past while. And we will find ways to bridge healing to those wounds, and we will find ways to once again feel the wind of his spirit, fill our lives so that in turn, we may be the people of God that he has anointed and is raising up to be the reflectors of his love and of his life and of his glory. So how are we going to do this? That's the big question. But there's a real simple answer. We're going to do it together together. I am not the great white knight coming in to rescue you. I believe that you have actually got the strength and the courage and the resilience and the capacity to do that. How do I know? You're here. Today, in this room, We are gathered together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible in 2 Corinthians 3.17 reminds us, the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is present, there is freedom. I love how Hill Songs penned this into a song a number of years ago. Listen. For we know the truth, Your truth has set us free. In your name alone, we have been released. You are here with us. You are here with us. We are slaves no more. Freedom is our hope. Never looking back. Jesus, you are Lord. We give all to you. We give all to you. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, chains are broken, eyes are open. Christ is with us. Christ is with us. Who the Son has freed, he is free indeed. All our sin is gone. We have been redeemed. Jesus paid it all. Open wide the gates of heaven. Fill our hearts as we surrender. Lord, let your presence fall. Lord, let your presence fall. And so Jan and I are here with you on a journey to embrace all the good things that God has in store and to help you use your past experience, both the good and the painful, to be redemptive means to seeing God do amazing things for the cause of his kingdom in Terrace, in the Northwest, in Canada, and the world. In other words... Jen and I want to get you excited about who you are, what you are, what you have, and what can still be for you. We want to inspire you to see that you can go far beyond where you are right now. And to that end, our pathway forward over the next number of months and year or so, who knows, nobody knows, um, is going to first of all involve some personal and some corporate reflection. Uh, in terms of where we've been. Um, I am here this week. Uh, Jan is flying back to Chilliwack tomorrow, and I'm going to be here for another week and flying back home next Monday, a week tomorrow. And so in this week, I've got appointments scheduled with a number of you, not all of you, but a number of you have signed up, and we really appreciate that. Um, But don't worry if you're going, oh, I really want to talk to John. Um, there will be continued opportunity for you to do that. Um, we're going to be back in May for the May long weekend. Um, and so we'll be parachuting, well, hopefully not parachuting. Um, we'll be flying in uh, to Terrace uh, for that weekend. And, and then in July, we'll make our formal move here. But what we need to remind ourselves is that as we do some of this reflective work, and sometimes this is painful work because we would rather forget what's behind and just forget it. 
but that's never helpful or healing. Um, we need to engage together to bridge some of the repairs and or amends, as the 12 steps remind us, that may yet need to be undertaken. And from there, we're going to engage in some of these practices now, unencumbered, free, to move forward with renewed vision for the future. Now, I know the temptation is to jump into the future. Let's, let's just jump into the future. Let's, let's create some new frameworks and some new understanding. But if we don't do the work of healing, uh, then we're going to end up in the same place uh, that we've been, and that is never helpful. I understand there's a doctor in the house. Is that true? See, he's not here today. Oh, Dr. Roberts. Anyways, um, no doctor will ever prescribe you medication, I, I would hope not, uh, without doing the underlying work of careful assessment to help you as a patient not just get appropriate medication, but to also look at underlying causes and underlying things that may be at work in your life and look at other things that you may be needing to do to address the pain that you experience. There's all kinds of great things that Terrace Alliance could be jumping into right now and doing, but if we jump on the bandwagon and the next one that makes its way through Terrace, uh, the chances are we'll be back in the same place months and years from now. And so in the infamous words of Alcoholics Anonymous, who you'll hear coming from me, I quote them a lot, um, <laughs> because I think they're very helpful. And one of the things that in the big book of AA, it says if nothing changes, anybody know the rest of that line? If nothing changes, nothing changes. We can dream about change. We can pray for change. Um, we can get all wrapped up in planning change. And, but if we don't actually change, then nothing changes. And change is what we want, right? Hopefully. We want change here? Of course we do. Um, but we don't want to change just for change's sake. What we want is to allow the Spirit of God to change not our external circumstances, but to change what's going on here in our heart. It's a heart change. That's what God's wanting to perform. Popping a pill or building new structures or programs for the church or quitting the church or giving up or simply avoiding pain are pathways to continued sickness and fatigue and failure. And so my work here for you as a transitional pastor is to help us create and build a healthy foundation for the work of God and the work that he wants to build in and through us. And I have no idea what the future glory of Terrace Alliance Church looks like. God does. But to get there, there are some foundational things that we need to work on. The wounds, as I said earlier, that you may have experienced are redeemable assets for the future of Terrace Alliance. Henry Nouwen uh, once said, he said, the best healers are wounded healers. And I rather like that because there are many people who, who have, haven't experienced any pain, and yet they're coming in trying to tell people what to do. Uh, it doesn't usually work very well. But people who have experienced pain, which is, I can guarantee you, all of us, right? We're human. And if, if, as we've allowed the healing touch of Jesus to work and mend in our lives, now we've got something in a greater capacity to give to others. I've also discovered in my work in the last 10 years of being away from Terrace Alliance because I moved into the whole realm of addiction recovery, which has been my primary focus where I work. And I've discovered that quick solutions are never lasting solutions. It just doesn't work. Works good for the first 20 days. <laughs> uh, but again, if that internal change hasn't taken place, all we do is put on a Band-Aid at best and we leave the wound untreated, to which there are severe and unwanted consequences. So our commitment, Jan and mine, is to walk with you and to walk with Jesus through what may seem like a minefield, or some have reflected on it as a valley of the shadow of death. And if we take Psalm 23 as kind of a backdrop into that, for those of you who know that text, fear no evil. Fear no evil. The Lord is with us. The good shepherd walks among us, and he is caring for us, and he heals us, and he will guide us on right paths. Do you believe that? 
Amen. Amen. You can say it. This is a good church to say it. Amen. He will, he will heal us. He'll restore us. But he will not restore us to past successes or past glory, but to the glory that has yet to be revealed to us in Christ. And his spirit's oil will cover us and wash over us always. And so never lose hope, never lose joy. If Jan and I felt that Terrace Alliance Church was a lost cause without hope, I wouldn't have quit an amazing job or committed to buying a home and moving back to this community, which we have done. God hasn't given up on you, and neither have we. It's weird. It's weird. Not too many pastors go back to a church they pastored before. There we go. Absolutely. The best days of PAC, Paris Alliance Church, are yet ahead. And Jan and I are honored to join with you on God's mission. Some of you have read Henry Blackaby's book, Experiencing God, 20, 25 years ago maybe that he wrote it. But he once famously said this in his book, if you want to know God's will for your life, find out where God is working and go join him there. Well, that's what Jan and I have done. Because we know that God is working here. We know that. And we've seen evidence of that, even through some of the trauma and pain that some of you may have experienced. And that's what we've done. We've, we are joining God on his mission. And I invite us together to join with God in this great adventure of building a church that isn't just going to survive. That's not what we want. We want to thrive, right? We're not about hanging on. We're about finding space inside of ourselves and relying on the magnificent, powerful presence of God's Spirit. And so we're going to sing again. But I want you to know that Jan and I love you. We love you. And I want you to know that God loves you. Stand once again. We're going to pass the basket. Oh, good for you. <laughs> oh, as we sing. We'll take an offering, and we're just going to make a couple announcements. I welcome the people that moved earlier when we started. Uh, just a couple things. Um, dear Jesus, we thank you that you are our provider. Practical, spiritual, emotional. You have it all. And thank you that you so willingly give us so generously. So we just thank you, and we give these offerings up to you. May you extend it to its your kingdom purposes to the full extent. In Jesus' name, amen. We do. I do want to uh, highlight a couple more things. Lisa Rorick is a Christian Missionary Alliance missionary that works in the Pacific District. She will be coming here and gracing, giving a sermon, giving her um, a little bit of her life and what the Christian Missionary Alliance is about with missions. She's coming May 1st, May 14th. Our district superintendent is coming. His name is Mark Peters. He will also be giving a sermon. And May 22, as John um, said, he will be back. So if you want time for interviews, you can always approach me after the service today, and I will jot down your name and your phone number and get that to, to John. Also, if you want an email for the church's announcements, I just need you to indicate to me that you want that, and I can add you to the distribution list. Um, again, we'll just say thank you, and worship team, take it away. Let's read from Joshua 5, 1 to 15. Now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until we had crossed over, their hearts melted and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. 
So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gabeah Haraloth. I hope I'm saying that right. Now this is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the desert on the way after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the desert during the journey from Egypt had not. The Israelites had moved about in the desert 40 years until all the men who were of military age when they left Egypt had died, since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land that he had solemnly promised their fathers to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So he raised up their sons in their place, and these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they'd not been circumcised on the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the place has been called Gilgah to this day. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgah on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after. They ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commanded, commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for this place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Thank you, Shirley, for reading that for us. Powerlessness. You know the feeling? Powerlessness. Don't you just hate it? Ugh. For the Jews of Joshua's day, there were two things that we discovered in what Shirley just read that they were completely powerless over, and it changed them for which they had no control. The manna stopped coming, and the pillar of fire ceased to lead them and light their way. Here, the Jews discovered the necessity of change in order to survive. Joshua 5, verse 11 and 12 that Shirley read, said the day after Passover, the people ate food that grew in that land, and they ate bread made without yeast and roasted grain. And the next morning, the manna from heaven stopped coming. This happened the first day after the people ate the food that grew in the land of Canaan. And from that time on, the Israelites did not get manna from heaven. Prior to this experience, and just prior to what Shirley read for us this morning, recorded one book back in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 33, Moses' last act on earth before he died was to bless the tribes of Israel before they crossed over the Jordan River into the Promised Land. And this declaration that Moses gave to them was one of the ways that God prepared them for the challenges that were ahead of them. There was a really good transition about to wait them as they came to the Jordan River and crossed through onto dry land. It was a challenge. And then there was lots of other challenges that awaited them just around the corner. Uh, things like, ooh, circumcision, which we're not going to talk about today, uh, fortunately. Um, and uh, some of the other transitions that, that were awaiting them. 
So as Moses had made his declaration coming into Joshua chapter 1, we know that the children of Israel crossed over from Egypt into the promised land. Our best guesstimate would be that there was about 2 million people that made this journey across the Jordan River. Now, the Jordan River, for those of you who may have some uh, topography skills, um, it, the river has the lowest uh, elevation of any river in the world. So it's actually below sea level. It's up to three kilometers wide, and it's known to be anywhere from 50 to 200 feet deep, depending on where it's meandering its way through the terrain and the seasons of the year. And here in our story today, we are told that it was flood season um, with the banks of the river swollen and overflowing. Uh, Jan and I have that experience last November, as some of you may have heard, that there was a flood in the Fraser Valley, and uh, it was something to behold. We usually don't associate danger with promotion <laughs> and increase, but God's people and people all over the world fail and walk away from God or from doing good just as much as when things are going well as when they're not going so good. So it doesn't take much. We can look on the surface of the entertainment world and the movie stars and actors that uh, entertain us, and they can be promoted and they can be famous, and then they usually get taken out at the knees somewhere in their journey. And I think lots of businesses go through that same uh, journey as well. And I think almost any venture in our own lives, we know that. And so here, God did several things to prepare the children of Israel to adapt to the ever-changing situation that was on the ground in front of them. And these, again, included things like circumcision and Passover and the visit by the commander-in-chief of the angel armies, holy cow. And those experiences were coming, but we're not going to really delve into that part of the story today. Our text says that the manna ceased. Perhaps the two most mysterious events in the life of the Jewish people are the one before us in this text today, and the other is one that is never spoken about in the Bible, but both have to do with the way that God related and revealed himself to his people. So the first has to do with how the children of Israel got their food. Now, Paul, uh, thousands of years later, recording his reflections on this story, provides a twist in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 5, which tells us that what happened to them in the natural, uh, the manna that was coming down, ceased. But that was to teach the children of Israel, including those of us now here today at Terrace Alliance, that there are spiritual principles at stake in this matter. So Paul says this in 1 Corinthians, Brothers and sisters, I want you to know that what happened to our ancestors who were with Moses, they were all under the cloud, and they all walked through the sea, and they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and they ate the same spiritual food, and they all drank the same spiritual drink, and they drank from that spiritual rock that was with them, that rock was Christ. Manna, food, natural, can be compared to our spiritual daily food. And they went literally from being fed by their father's bakery every day when they woke up to now having to provide for their own meals. Hmm. Now, most children in life make that adjustment fairly naturally, don't they? Um, but every once in a while, there are still those who want to be fed, even though they're quite capable of feeding themselves. And Paul later laments this truth when he said, well, I gave you milk and not meat because you, weren't, you were still a baby. You weren't ready to take that on. And so, in other words, God's children weren't willing to grow up. And that's what God was doing for the Jews in our story here today. 
this was God's goal for the children, that they be prepared to go into the promised land and that they would learn how to care and nurture themselves. In essence, God was saying, you are now old enough to make your own breakfast. Huh. Now, there was another major change for the children of Israel. And as I said earlier, it's never spoken about in the Bible again. And that was the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Both of these things completely disappeared when they crossed over the Jordan River into the promised land. So what is that pillar of fire by night and the cloud by, uh, uh, by day? What, what's that about? Well, there are three purposes of the cloud and the fire. One was to provide direction. They needed to know where they're going in this journey through Egypt to the promised land, and that was part of the movement of the cloud. But they also provided illumination, right, so that they could actually see where they were going. And then it also provided assurance that God was with them that everything was going to be okay. So think of it like this. Um, think of a way a parent cares and supports their children. It changes over time. Now, some of you have adult children. How many of you have adult children over the age of 18? Okay. I can guarantee you that you do not parent your 18-plus-year-old the same way you do today when they were two. Because if you do, unless you're a hovering helicopter parent, um, we treat them differently, right? We should. The goal is to help them become independent and interdependent. And so uh, when we think about that, God was doing the same thing for them. He began to transition the way that he chose to reveal himself to his kids. Now, a lot of Jews were probably kind of troubled by, like, by that because they kind of like, Wake up every morning and there's food on the table. Oh, um, how's that happen? Oh, good. And now you're expecting me to actually go out into the fields and grain and put something together? God's saying, yeah. Now, many of the Jews probably thought, oh, there's no pillar of fire, and there's no cloud, and there's no food. God must have abandoned us. Right? That would be kind of a normal, natural thing to think. Where's God? We're all alone. Here we are on the other side of the Jordan River, and we're... Uh, now what? One of the things that God does, and he's great at doing this, is he never abandons us, but he shows himself in different ways in different times to help us mature and grow. God never does the same thing the way he always does it. He always changes, fortunately, but sometimes it doesn't feel that way in the moment. So an illustration of this is the Elijah the prophet. Some of you may remember the story as he models for us the way to handle transition in terms of trying to hear God's voice, right? And so here's Elijah in the cave running away from Jezebel, and God was not in the fire. Well, God was not in the mighty blowing wind. God was not in the earth shaking under his feet, but God was in the still, small voice. What, what, Josh, or what Elijah realized is that the whispers of God are just as powerful and true as when he shouts like a hurricane. God reveals himself differently at different times to us. So let's talk about transition in general. And then look at some ways for us to effectively respond. Transition is how we adapt when God or life requires us to move from one state of being to another. We need to go from X to Y. Now, some transitions we choose, while others are kind of thrust on us to which we are completely powerless. Success in life or failure in life is often determined by how we handle these transitions. And this is true for us individually. It's true as a family. It's true as a church body. It's true of business owners. Let me illustrate. There's something in life we call midlife crisis. Um, it's a transition of getting older when we begin to realize that the candle of our life is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. 
and our body begins to change <laughs> with the relentless passage of time. Oh my goodness, where's my hair? <laughs> Thank you. I love it. And some people in midlife crisis make some really weird choices in terms of dealing with their transition. And uh, so many people destroy their finances, they destroy their families, and in many ways uh, destroy uh, their purpose and meaning in life. Or think about young people uh, who graduate from high school and they go away to college or engage in a new career. And invariably, in these transitions, they come to the reality and they wake up one morning and they go, holy smokes, I can do whatever I want. I don't have a parent looking, again, unless they have a helicopter parent, I don't have a parent looking over my shoulder seeing what I'm doing, so I'm kind of free to do whatever I want. And so what they begin to do is they're transitioning from this state of um, uh, dependence to independence. They're moving from one state of being to another, and they have freedom to make choices, good and or bad, that will eventually affect them for the rest of their lives, or at least for a very long time. Churches that were once successful and growing can experience a crisis in leadership, and sometimes those things can implode. And unwilling to change and transition to do what is right can cause some serious harm to its identity and to its effectiveness of being God's instrument or agent of grace to one another and to the community in which it exists. And that's why I'm so proud of you here in this room today. In the stress of losing a pastor, you are now engaging a process here together with Jan and myself so that we can find our bearings and make appropriate decisions to grow and flourish and not wither and die. Right? We have choices. And now we're beginning to engage some choices, and I'm very proud of you. Or think about prosperous industries. Some of you will, reckon, some of you will have no idea who these things are. But there are some industries that fail to maneuver with the time and with all of the transitions that are going on in society. Think about BlackBerry. Anybody remember them? I think they finally went on to business about a year ago or somewhere, not too terribly long ago. But it, it was, if you had a BlackBerry, man, it, it's kind of like Apple today. But um, you were really something, and, and to be envied, it doesn't exist anymore. Do you remember Lotus Spreadsheets? Uh, do you remember Xerox Desktop Publishing? Do you remember uh, Kodak Cameras? All were hugely successful. They were mammoth industries. But they failed to change and adjust to transition. Transition happens to any one of us in the blink of an eye. At any given point in our life, we're only a phone call or a text message or an email or a one-minute conversation away from a radical transition in our lives that we thought our lives were once stable, and in a moment they become unraveled. Doctor tells us we have cancer. Transition. A vacation condo, all of a sudden we're finding ourselves in the emergency room. We go from rainfall to drought. We go from married to single, from single to married. We go from empty nester to rejoicing grandparent. We go from single to dating, and we go from dating to single. And we go from employed to unemployed, and we go from unemployed to employed, or we go getting lots of overtime to all of a sudden being without a job or shut down. Transition. Because transitional moments are so critical in our lives, you will often find that God shows up in a very special way in those moments to help us through. God does his best work in difficult circumstances. Whatever you're going through today in your life, and it's hard, that's God's opportunity if you give him that opportunity. In the case of the Jews going into the promised land, the commander of the angel armies shows up and he meets with Joshua. <laughs> and Josh is probably doing this, uh, looking up at this massive being and he falls down and he worships and he recognizes there's something about this being that's different. Some scholars 
believe that this may have been the incarnate Jesus himself. Could be. We don't know. Jesus not yet born, yet fully alive. And the revelation of God to Joshua, whether an angel or God himself, was preparing and encouraging Joshua for the challenges that were ahead. I also want to show you another example of transition in the life of Jesus. Just prior, if you remember, Jesus was tested in the desert, right, by the devil for 40 days. Just prior, it could have been hours, maybe a day or two, probably no longer than that. There's this wonderful moment where just prior to his testing, God speaks over him. And God the Father says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. For 30 years, Jesus had lived in obscurity, living at home in relative peace and quiet, not too famous. And he was about to transition from serenity to turmoil. And immediately after his Jordan River experience, interesting, right? In his Jordan River experience, we read this in Luke 4. Now filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus returned from the Jordan River, and then the Spirit led him into the desert. You get that? It was the Spirit that led him into the desert, into the place of trial, into the place of temptation, into the place of great uh, misery and pain and agony. And there it says, the devil tempted Jesus for 40 days, and Jesus ate nothing during this time. And when it was finished, he was very hungry. Now, before I talk about how Jesus overcame his transition, let me just mention that God will often lead you and me to places that we do not understand so that he can show up and do something wonderful and powerful and glorious because there's something of his nature that has yet to be revealed in us. So followers of Christ here today at Terrace, if Jesus leads you to a dark place, it's so that you can learn that he is the light of the world. If he leads you to the valley, it's so that you can know that he is the lily of the valley. If he leads you to shaky ground, it's so that you can know that he is your sure foundation. If he leads you into an emotional storm, it's so that you can experience him as your peace. If he leads you into a time of war, he is the Lord strong and mighty in battle. If he leads you to a season of crying, it's so that you can know him as the great comforter. If he leads you into a season of constraint where your hands and your heart are tied, it's so that you can know that he is your freedom. So let's get back to Jesus being led from that wonderful scene at the Jordan River just before his entrance into the desert. He goes from a foot stomping, hand clapping, snot running down your face, shouts of joy, ringing angels dancing, holy goose bumps, raised revival in his life into a season of severe testing and trial. And in that season of trial without any food for 40 days. But it can last longer than 40 days for some of you, can it? We know that. There are two ways that Jesus managed this time of transition from that of a carpenter homeboy into his role as Savior of the world, which we celebrate today. And so Jesus was in this hallway in between two worlds. And for him, it was short, as I said. But here are two things that I think really helped Jesus. And I think what I can demonstrate to you is that these are the very same things that God gave to Joshua back in Joshua chapter 5. First was the word of God spoken over him. Remember, God says to his son and to those around, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, Jesus had all kinds of words spoken over him in his life. Blasphemer, illegitimate child, demon-possessed, sinner, drunkard, and glutton. 
Those were all spoken over him. But Jesus didn't allow the opinion of the world to dominate his mental landscape. In essence, Jesus said, I don't accept your opinion of me. I am the beloved son of my father in whom he is well pleased. That's the opinion that he lived by. And, and somewhere along in your journey, each of you here today, God needs to personally communicate that same thought to you. His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, deeply loved, deeply cared for, and given life and purpose and meaning. That's who you are. Then you can begin to confidently say, God is for me. Who can be against me? We can stand, not hunched over, but strengthened and renewed by the Spirit's power because of the word spoken over us. So, Joshua, what's the story? Back in Joshua chapter 1, verse 5, it says this. God is speaking to Joshua. He says, just as I was with Moses, I will be with you. No one will be able to stop you all your life. I will not abandon you. I will never leave you. Well, if we read through Joshua, uh, there's lots of challenges and lots of other transitions that are to come. And Joshua hangs on to this truth because at the very end of Joshua, he says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And he made that choice because he knew who he was. He knew that he was loved and cared for and supported by God. You see, when you have the word of God spoken over you, you can deal with any testing that comes your way. Believe it. Remember your love. You are not what other people say about you. You will never be alone. Let his word spoken over you be the driver of your life. Secondly, Jesus not only used the word of God spoken over him, but the word of God that lived in him. Remember, so we get the word of God over us, and we get the word of God in us. So here it is back in Joshua. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. It says, God says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall read it and reflect on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything in accordance with all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will be successful. There you have it. Fairly simple, is it not? Personal assurance of God's favor and word spoken over you, and the word of God dwelling in you richly are the keys to help you and to help us together successfully navigate the transitional moments of our lives and in the life of our church moving forward. We're at an interesting crossroads in the life of our church, Harris Alliance, aren't we? Who of us two months ago, three months ago, would have seen where we are? <laughs> we, we couldn't, right? And, and whew, um, we get feeling like a, obliterated somehow with all the adjustments and changes that have, have to have been made. But here, on Easter Sunday, we get to reflect the most significant transition of all time. Jesus, son of Mary. Jesus, son of God, who three days earlier was crucified, dead, buried. The Bible tells us that unless a seed dies in the ground, it will not live. was true for Jesus as well. It's true for us today, Terrace Alliance, because we have to process those things that have died, as it were, inside of us or lost in terms of people and friends and a pastor, some of our hopes and dreams that have felt like they've been wiped away. Don't lose heart. Jesus rose from the grave, 
and so too shall we. The cross symbolizes that for which pain and sorrow and death and that which is yet to be faith, hope, and love. There's two arms on the cross. There's the past and there's the future. For some of us, we will continue to grieve. For some of us, frustrations may continue to emerge and fears and anger may arise. That's okay. They're just emotions. Uh, we're not driven by our emotions. That's not what leads us and guides us. We're led by the risen Christ who moves among us and is with us. Perhaps as a church, it feels like we're in the middle of the Jordan right now. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, we've put our foot into the into what was water, which now becomes dry land. But sometimes it can feel like we're stuck between the past and the future. What We can look back and we fondly and or painfully think about what's behind, and we're just kind of trying to hang on to see what's really out there in the promised land. And life is hard. Sometimes it's difficult. It really shouldn't surprise us all that much, but often it does. Sometimes we think as followers of Jesus that somehow things will just be nice and wonderful. But as we keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, we will succeed and together we shall overcome. The best days of Paris Alliance are yet ahead of us, and of that I have no doubt. And it was for the children of Israel who crossed over and transitioned sorry, successfully to the promised land, so too shall we. Because the resurrected Jesus is now with us, and our hope, as the hymn writer said, is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock we stand, all other ground is sinking sand. At our crossroads today, come to the place in our time together, we're going to celebrate communion. Communion may look a little different than it normally does. I'm not, I've been away for 10 years, so I don't know all of your practices uh, that you've adapted over the years. As we think of communion today, and we think of the cross, which symbolizes what went before, and this which represents, to some degree, was there, but also what was there. Um, what I would like us to think about doing, no pressure, no guilt, no shame. You'll never get that. I trust for me ever. And if you do, let me know, <laughs> please. But as we think about communion, we think about what it is that Jesus has done for and in the season of our transition, there's been some things that perhaps we felt, some hurts that we've experienced, some pain. Um, perhaps even we may feel like we have sinned or perhaps have been sinned against. Again, it's no shocking revelation for us. It's what do we do with it? And so we're going to come for communion, and uh, Rob's going to play some music gently over us. Uh, in this time, where up at the front, I've got some post-it notes, um, which you can just tear one off. And if there's something that you want to, and I think I know this is part of your experience on Good Friday at the service at the Christian Reformed Church, if you were there, but um, we're going to take and just write out something on those pieces of paper. Don't sign your name. We don't care who it is. That's not the issue. The issue, what we want you to do is to fill it out on that sticky note and then just take that sticky note and place it somewhere on the cross. And there may not be room. You just put it down at the foot of the cross. That's fine. But you also may discover in these moments, because communion is a holy space. Everything's holy. But this is a holy space where God is trying to do something within our... And you may recognize, there's somebody I need to talk to. There's somebody that I just need to best to, or maybe these things aren't quite right, and I just want to try to make something right. doesn't mean that the pain will go away. Sometimes we think that forgiveness is getting rid of pain. That's not what forgiveness is about. 
Forgiveness is then learning to live with the pain and keep surrendering to it. But to make sure that our hearts are clean and right with one another, God, church, right? That's what sets us apart from any other group in the community. We're church. And as church, we're family. And as family, do we do we hurt and sin one another? Of course we do. <laughs> Not usually intentionally. But we do, so don't worry about it. There's no shame in this, but feel free to come. And then Jan and I are going to be at the front, and we have communion, and then you can come. Maybe some of you just want to come and pray. Maybe there are some of you that are going, you know what, I have a need. I have a need for healing in my life. I have a need for some broken spaces in my life. And we would invite you to come. We, the front pew is open. There's no shame if you don't or if you do. And then I'm just going to invite those in the congregation that feel comfortable in being able to pray for somebody. So maybe you see somebody here and you just want to get up and say, I'm just going to come alongside and sit with you. You've got permission uh, to do that. Right? It's, it's open. This is community. This is part of, will be part of our continued expression. So I just invite you, um, some of you just may want to come for communion, and that's all. Some of you may want to stick a sticky note on, you can do that. Some of you may just want to come and pray here, you're right. That's okay. Uh, so for the next, I don't know, I don't know how many minutes, we'll see what God does in these moments. Um, come. And so, Jan, why don't you come, and we'll be here. You can come up, post-it notes and pens are at the front. And if there's something you want to stick on the cross, it's just a symbol for you. I'm leaving this with God. I can't fix it. I'm powerless over some things, but fortunately the power of God through his blood can do many wonderful, powerful things. And so this is our time just to reflect on.
morning. Let us pray together. Come on, Daryl. Let us pray as Tom prays. This morning, Lord, let us pray as Tom prays. Let's pray together. Good morning. Let us pray as Tom prays. Lynn. Thank you, I'm John. Well, we get to praise the Lord together. He is good, always. And it, it doesn't depend on circumstance. It uh, doesn't depend on whether things are going good or things are going bad. God is good all the time. So there's something that we're going to do. We're going to do today. We're going to do next Sunday when I'm here as well. And then when Jan and I get to move here, or most of us move here uh, in July, um, it's going to be interesting because kind of what, what our scenario is going to look like is uh, I'll be about three weeks in here to Terrace and a, a week back in Chilliwack. Um, but Jan's going to try to make it up because she's still working. And uh, so she'll be trying to make it up every once a month or so. We hope as well in this journey. And then we don't know. God's also working some other things in our life. But as we connect in this transi transitional season, it's important that we affirm some things together about who we are. Who are we? Because what happens to us, regardless of what's going on in the life of the church or life at home, we begin to lose sight of who it is that God has created us to be. And so, I'm not saying I don't, this is not a prideful thing, so don't hear it that way, but I've created this, 
mantra, uh, if I can use that term for us, is benediction, it will be a benediction today, that we will recite together because we do life together. The church is about being together. And so um, if I'm going to ask you to stand and I'm going to ask you to speak these words with me that you will see on the screen. I realize that now I probably have to use a different font uh, to, to maybe help. But if you can't see really well, you can move forward. So let's recite these words together. I am not my past. I am not what I have done. I am not what I possess. I am who God says I am. I am loved. I am chosen. I am forgiven. I am free. I am his child. Worry and fear are not my master. I trust in God. His peace guards my heart and my mind. I am not a slave to my habits or stuck in my hurts. I am healed. I have been rescued from the power of darkness and brought into the kingdom of God's light. Having all I need, I will flourish in every good work, and together with those of common faith, we will continue to love and influence people for the greater good. Hopefully, we'll get that memorized, but don't worry about it. Memory is not the important thing. Focusing on who we are. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face, his beautiful face, shine upon you. Gracious to you. And may you go in peace in Jesus' name. Amen.